In many ways, the world of today has been greatly shaped by events from the 19th century. There were revolutions, political, social, and industrial, which had a huge impact on people's lives. Imperialism and colonization brought those impacts all across the world. And changing ideas emerged with ideologies attached to them, which continue to influence society to this very day. Of course, medicine was also impacted by all these things and had impact of its own, and changed in many ways throughout the 19th century. So, as we conclude our four-part brief overview of medicine in the West, let's now turn and take a look at the 19th century. Also, just to let you know, I've been sick throughout the recording of this video, which is a little ironic, I know. Um, so, just a forewarning, my voice might sound a little weird throughout this video, but not much I can do about it, so let's move on. In the 1970s, the sociologist Nicholas Jusin described a fundamental shift which took place in the understanding of the body in the 19th century. Whereas in the past, the patient was seen as a sick man or woman, in this period, medicine began to focus on diseased parts of the body. Someone suffering from tuberculosis was seen as having a disease in his lungs, or even in the tissue of his lungs, and treatment needed to be localized to that part of the body. Now, aspects of Jusin's narrative have since come under scrutiny as being overly simplistic or held up by little historical evidence, but overall, this shift is quite accurate and came about due to a number of factors, most of which are continuations of trends which began earlier. If you've seen my previous videos in this series, you'll know that before this point, disease was indeed seen as something which affected the whole body. Usually disease was caused by some sort of imbalance in the body as a whole, which might manifest in a localized fashion, such as in the case of cancer, but generally this was seen as a symptom of a larger issue, which was counteracted with whole body treatments. This was the theory, anyway. There were always outliers like sore teeth thought to be caused by worms, and empirical treatments, used even by the most learned doctors, sometimes treated a local area. But this was usually seen as having some sort of explanation in the whole body theory which had just yet to be fully understood. However, things began to change as surgery was brought closer and closer into the realm of learned medicine. Surgeons, who frequently dealt with localized ailments, some even polling said sore teeth, were much more accustomed to seeing ailments as being caused by a localized issue, be it a broken bone or a bladder stone. Through the long and slow process of surgery, and with it anatomy, becoming respected in the field of medicine, physicians studying anatomy gradually shifted their understanding of disease. The integration of surgery into medicine was completed early in the 19th century. In post-revolutionary France, medical schools and surgery schools were finally merged, and Paris's influence in the field of medicine at this time led to a similar windfall across Europe and the Americas. For the first time, surgeons received the exact same medical education as physicians, and they became, essentially, a specialization in medicine, rather than a class of craftsmen subservient to the medical elite. The increased focus on disease of the parts of the body in turn elevated surgery even further. Surgical intervention was increasingly used as a treatment, building off of the new techniques that had already been developing in the 18th century, and surgeons began to obtain the reputation which they hold to this day of medical heroes, rather than that of simply butchers as they were previously often stereotyped. Disease of the parts, however, also meant disease of the insides, the organs. Thanks to new developments such as the stethoscope of René Lenec in 1819, doctors could more readily understand what was going on inside of a patient's body, and correlate external signs to internal lesions, as they were called. Lenek himself used his invention to discover that tuberculosis was caused by tubercules in the lung, which could be detected through the sound produced when one thumped their finger on the patient's chest, as well as the sound of their breathing. Surgeons, of course, were in a unique position to have access to the inside of the human body. Unfortunately for those suffering from tuberculosis, a surgeon couldn't simply remove their lungs, at least not with a survival rate above zero. But other issues, like gangrene or even breast cancer, could be dealt with in this way. 
It has traditionally been assumed that the rise in surgery was due to developments in surgical technology, namely anesthesia and antisepsis. However, as historians of surgery have noted more recently, changes in attitude towards the body were just as, if not more, important in this development. Indeed, I think a former professor of mine, Thomas Schlick, put it quite well when he pointed out how, in a world where the restoration of balance was seen as the way to cure disease, the cutting open of the body to remove a small part of the intestine, as is often done today for appendicitis, would have seemed completely absurd. It was important, therefore, for these conceptual changes to occur for anyone to even think about cutting open bodies. Keep in mind that traditional surgical procedures were done on the exterior. This is also reflected in the fact that some of these internal procedures were being developed and performed even before anesthesia and antisepsis had been discovered, with speed, alcohol, and the strength of several men holding the patient down being the tools of operation. That isn't to say that these technologies weren't important, of course. The development of anesthesia, starting with ether, commonly used from the 1840s, made surgery far more appealing, contributing to its heroic reputation. The development of antisepsis was also important as it made surgery much safer. Certain substances had been used to counteract putrefaction in wounds for centuries, but Joseph Lister was the first to give a scientific rationale for the use of carbolic acid during operations, using it to disinfect the wound, surgical tools, and even the air by spraying it as a mist. In 1867, he connected it to Louis Pasteur's emerging germ theory, arguing that the carbolic acid killed the germs which caused putrefaction. The merits of antisepsis were debated at length, with some fearing that constant disinfection might slow healing, and by the 1880s, it was largely replaced by asepsis, that is, the prevention of contagion from entering the operation room in the first place. This meant that hands and tools were cleaned outside, and gowns were introduced to keep outside agents from coming in. This also drastically changed the operating room itself. The open, wooden theater was replaced by a closely monitored room with easily cleaned tile walls, and, as time went on, gloves and eventually masks became the norm. Surgery, of course, wasn't taking place in the home. Even before these aseptic developments in the last few decades of the century, hospitals had been provided with specialized theaters, where dozens of onlookers could watch the operation. Some of these observers were students, and indeed, the presence of students in the hospital was a growing trend which continued from the 18th century. Classroom lectures remained important, of course, but in-person lessons at hospitals became a central part of medical education. This was connected to the fact that hospitals were finally becoming truly medical institutions. If you've watched my previous videos in this series, you'll remember that hospitals had for a long time simply been a place to stay, with physicians occasionally visiting to do charity work. By the end of the 18th century, however, hospitals became bigger and doctors did much of their practice there, though they still visited the homes of patients who could afford it, usually the wealthy. The hospital had a very different power relationship than the bedroom, and attending to dozens of patients at a time contributed to the depersonalization of medicine, which in turn contributed to the shift away from the view of the sick individual and towards that of the sick body and parts of the body. It also allowed for researchers to observe a larger number of subjects than ever before, allowing them to see trends and make discoveries. Using scientific method, many researchers could establish with a fair amount of certainty that many of the traditional therapies and drugs which had been used for centuries were actually ineffective. Healthy lifestyle, however, was still seen as being important and so some physicians simply diagnosed diseases and advised their patients on how to live more healthily. Others were dissatisfied with such a view, and vigorously experimented to find new therapies, especially in surgery. For others, however, the ineffectiveness of traditional cures was simply because they weren't being used enough, subscribing to the view of heroic medicine, which had already been growing in the late 18th century. In this view, the body had to be shocked into healing itself through rigorous purging and bloodletting. This last view eventually died out by the middle of the century, though not before forever skewing the popular perception of pre-contemporary medicine as being brutal and excessive. 
Those who sought new cures, however, helped contribute in the middle of the century to the rise of laboratory medicine. The lab got its start in the German states, where universities received a lot of funding and began to focus on research rather than just teaching. As scientific discoveries led many to see the body as functioning by means of physical and chemical processes no different from the rest of the world, researchers began experimenting using tissue and fluid samples sent in from hospitals for the purpose of diagnosis. These researchers were coming to conclusions about the nature of these diseases without even ever seeing the patient, further depersonalizing disease. As the century went on, more and more technologies were developed in medicine and chemistry which could help with these diagnoses and experiments, technologies which were located in labs. It was thanks to this laboratory shift that Louis Pasteur discovered bacteria and developed his germ theory in the middle of the century, and Robert Koch built upon it in the 1880s. Pasteur also developed vaccines in the lab against anthrax and rabies after isolating the bacteria causing them and developing weaker strains. The discovery in the 1890s that survivors of certain diseases became perpetually immune led to the development of the antiserum by Emil Bering and Kitasato Shibasaburo. This form of therapy used the serum from the blood of an individual who had produced antitoxins against the toxins emitted by a certain bacteria, which was transfused into the blood of a sick patient in order to cure them. Bering and Shibasaburo initially used it to cure diphtheria, one of the main causes of infant mortality at the time, though the method became popular for various other diseases, especially in the early 20th century. Another important process which took place in medicine in the 19th century is what has been called the professionalization of the field. Professionalization here is meant in the sociological sense, that is, that there became an increased sense that medical professionals were, well, the professionals, the orthodox, the standard, essentially the way most of us probably see them today. Again, if you've seen my previous videos, you'll remember that although university-trained physicians were often deemed the best, they were just one of several options in the so-called medical marketplace. But as time went on, the university-trained medical profession began to hold a stronger position as the standard. This started especially in the 1830s. Before this time, most European states had various grades of licensed healers. Afterwards, however, most states gradually pushed out those who didn't have a university degree as the medical profession united physicians, surgeons, and apothecaries into one profession with a standard basic education and simple specialization within. This standard education became more and more complex and difficult for the average person to understand, but it was deemed necessary for proper treatment of the sick. As doctors obtained prestige and an elevated position in society, they were increasingly seen as the rightful, orthodox practitioners of medicine. Well, mostly, anyway. Although the field probably couldn't be called a marketplace anymore, other forms of what might now be called unorthodox medicine remained. During a cholera outbreak in Zurich in 1867, for example, children were still given amulets to ward off the disease through magic. Likewise, the 19th century also saw the birth of alternative medicine, which directly defined itself in opposition to the orthodox view. This included things like homeopathy, hydrotherapy, naturopathy, and hypnotism, as well as foreign imports like acupuncture and yoga. Many of the proponents of alternative medicine saw orthodox medicine as dangerous, especially in regards to heroic medicine, or at least ineffective, partially in response to their rejection by the medical community, as well as to the increasingly esoteric and specialized nature of medical knowledge. They also frequently argued that their cures were tied to nature and the body's natural capacity to heal, likely reflecting 19th century pastoralism and romantic naturalism in the face of industrialization. Despite the professionalization of medicine, Alternative and unorthodox medicine was very rarely outlawed, as long as nobody was harmed as a result. Even when it was outlawed, this never caused it to go away. The balance of power had definitely shifted, but a complete monopoly on healing was not, and never has been, held by the medical profession. In some states, medical professionals were put in charge of the regulation of their own field, which helped them to dominate it. However, this was not always the case. 
States often did what they thought was best for their populace, though they could consult professionals for advice. This was especially the case for public health. The responsibility for public health was generally given to the local rather than state government, with city councils determining what measures were best for their region. The methods used to preserve health and stave off disease were often a mix of isolation, largely through quarantine and made more targeted after the discovery of bacteria, and environmental cleanup, including the construction of sewers, aqueducts, and bathing facilities, and the employment of city cleaners. Public health had been the concern of civic authorities for centuries, of course, but the increased urbanization of the 19th century and the subsequent rise in squalor and disease led to a massive increase in scale. Of course, as with many things, these measures were not applied evenly. Despite research concluding that disease was connected to poverty due to poor living conditions, it was richer neighborhoods which tended to benefit the most. The poor continued to live in crowded apartments and slums which might simply be fumigated when an epidemic was about, with the most extensive measures to reduce disease being to simply tear down some of the buildings on crowded streets, forcing them to just move somewhere else. The working class poor got their biggest relief with the introduction of public insurance schemes, which meant that they could finally gain access to some of the similar treatments as the middle classes at the least, who had been able to benefit from private insurance for a while by then. A form of public insurance was first introduced in Germany in 1883, and it quickly spread across Europe, paving the way for its expansion with the rise of the welfare state in the period after the First World War. And with that, our look at the 19th century and this series comes to a close. Obviously, this isn't the end of the history of medicine. Medicine continued to develop and grow throughout the 20th century and even now into the 21st century, and it will continue to do so as long as there are people practicing it. But I've decided that the end of the 19th century is a good place to end it for now. If you like this video and you'd like to see more like it, you can like the video and subscribe to this channel. I will be making more videos for years to come, hopefully. There will also be some about the history of medicine, but with this series' conclusion, I'm going to be branching out into other things. I've already started another series, um, which has caused this channel to explode, which is pretty awesome. And uh, I'll be continuing to work on that, as well as various other topics related to history um, throughout my videos. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.